Now, if you got your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Kids can, can go at this time. Well, if you get your Bibles ready, it's going to be up on the screen, but it's always good to, uh, to be there as well. I want you to stand up this morning as we read the Word of God, and uh, we're going to read our entire text. And so if you would, just stand with me. And we don't do this often, but we see this in Scripture sometimes, particularly in the Old Testament, people standing when the Word of God is read, and just a reminder of that uh, what we are entering into this time especially isn't taken lightly but that we have the very words of God before us. And so we're going to read 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods and which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the Word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished on the truths of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that, in every, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the Word of God. Let's be seated. Let me, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll, we're going to begin. Father God, we, we do believe that that is the very words that you would have us to know uh, today, to receive. And, and Father, we believe that, that this is the inspired, your inspired word. And so, Father, I pray today as we enter into this time that we will be mindful of what you would have to say to us today through your word. And so give us clarity and focus, and Lord, help us to hear from you. Uh, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And hey, we've been in this series now over these past couple of weeks where we've been studying through the book of First Timothy. And um, we're just calling this series Fight the Good Fight because in it, Paul uh, writes to Timothy his understudy, and on a couple of different occasions, he, he admonishes him to fight the good fight, to, uh, to fight the battle well. And the connotation is, is that just like a soldier is on the battlefield or a gladiator in the arena, that the Christian faith is a, is a, a battle. It's a, it can be a fight. It's a reminder to us that we are in a battle. And it's not a battle, Scripture says, of flesh and blood. Our, that's, that's not our battle. But it's a battle nonetheless because you and I have an enemy who wants to destroy us. Right? You've got an enemy who wants you to walk away from Jesus. And so that's why this text and really this book in general and this letter is so important. It's because not only do we know that Satan wants that to happen, but listen, God said it's going to happen. I mean that some followers are going to walk away from the truth. And so that's why this message is just so important today because some people, according to the Word of God, are going to abandon their faith in Jesus. And may that not be you. And may that not be you. 
Now, I'm guessing that anytime I preach a message like this, in which I talk about, you know, someone abandoned their faith or no longer walking with Christ, I know there's a question that comes up in your mind. So let me just sort of try to answer that real quick before we get into our text. Now, again, when I'm talking about someone walking away from their faith, the, the, the term is apostasy that we may use. I'm not implying that someone can lose their salvation like they lose a set of car keys. Right? No one can rob you of your salvation. Satan cannot pluck you from God's hand. Scripture makes it clear that there is nothing that any or nothing that can come between you and the love of God in Christ Jesus. So I'm not implying that. But I do believe that a person willingly can turn his or her back on God and walk away from a once saving relationship with him. And you may say, well, maybe they really weren't saved in, in the first place. And, and we'll save that discussion for another time. But clearly, someone can receive the message of Jesus with joy, begin a new life in Him, and then turn away. We find that in Scripture, right? I remember in Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells the parable of the, of the, of the farmer, and he's out sowing seed. Remember that? He says there's a farmer went out and he sowed seed. And he said, as he's sowing seed, some of the seed fell on the path. And some of the seed fell in the rocky places. And some of the seed fell among the thorns. And, and some of the seed fell among the good soul. And then he goes on to explain it like this in Mark chapter 4. It's going to be up on the screen. It says, the farmer sows, sows the word. And some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word accept it and produce a crop some 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. Now we like to focus on the last part of that parable, right? Where he talks about the, 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 the crop producing uh, a good harvest here. But in the meantime, Jesus says you're going to have all these occasions where the word is sown. Where the word of God is sown. Where the word of God is planted. But it doesn't last. Right? In fact, he said, there's times even when the word is received with joy, right? They buy a Bible. They start attending church. They go to Sunday school. They're excited about this good news of following Jesus. And for whatever reason, they walk away. And you, you know people like this, right? You and I know people that this has been their case. I mean, this has been their story. This is, you know, this parable that Jesus is telling is what they've experienced and you've seen it in their own life. At one point, there was a vibrant relationship with him, but no longer are they walking with God. Now, why does that happen? Well, according to Jesus, the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in, and they choose to walk away from God. Now, does that surprise you? Well, it shouldn't. Because our text tells us in verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith. In later times, some will abandon the faith. And again, I'm not saying that someone's going to steal your salvation, but Scripture consistently sends out this strong warning about falling away. And I think it's a warning that we need to heed this today, right? We, we need, how do we prevent apostasy? How do we prevent defecting from our faith? How do we prevent being the man in this parable that Jesus was talking about? Well, let's look at our text. Because I think it's helpful to us as we read the Word of God this morning. And notice first, as we study here in chapter 4, who Paul's authority is. He says the Spirit clearly says. Right? When he, when he says the Spirit here, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that all of God's Word, we believe it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. That God gave us His Word. He used men to write it, but it's inspired by God. 
but he s seems to be sending, uh, you know, saying a sort of a making a prophetic point here, right? He wants his people to his readers now and later to understand that God's sending out a warning here. In later times, people are going to abandon the faith. Now, anytime you read, you come up on that, that phrase, later times, or the last days, it's referring to the Christian era, right? Now, when I say the Christian era, I mean that time from when Jesus came, the first time he came, and, and the time in which he's going to come back again, right? This is the, the Christian era. This is the era that you and I are living in. And Paul says in later times, when he says in later times, it makes you think, well, he's talking about some point down the future, right? He's, he's, he's pointing to an event that's going to be way off down the road. But then notice that he gives modern day examples, right? He says they forbid certain foods. They prevent you from getting married. And so when he says, the Spirit says in later times, he's not only referring to the future, which are times that you and I live in now, but he's also talking about his modern day, the day that he was living in. And so according to the words of the Holy Spirit, some people then and some people now are going to abandon their faith. Now notice how it always happens. What did he say? He said they follow deceiving spirits. He said that there's going to be times they're going to abandon their faith and they're going to follow deceiving spirits. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars. They're taught by demons whose, whose conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. For everything God created is good and nothing's to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving and consecrated by the Word of God. See, what was happening in this church, you had these false teachers who were coming in. And, and, and Paul said they were teaching things taught by demons, right? Now, they didn't have pitchforks in their hands. They weren't wearing a red suit. You, you, know, you couldn't recognize them. In fact, if you saw them, you would say, you know, they're very intelligent. Maybe they were a uh, very good, uh, you know, a good communicator, whatever it may be. But they were under demonic influence because they were trying to drag people away from God. They were preaching a, an ascetic message, right? You know what that is? You've, you've probably heard that term before. It was this message of self-denial. It was a strong message of severe discipline. They were teaching people that if you really wanted to be spiritual, that you had to really deny yourself in two areas, food and sex. They said if you really want to be spiritual, then you deny yourself marriage. You, you don't eat certain foods. Then you'll be on the next level, right? Then you'll really be spiritual. Then you'll really please God. This is how you get to this upper level of discipleship. You do these things. And the premise behind their teaching, this is what we see coming in the early church, was this early form of Gnosticism. Was where they believed that the body was actually, uh, uh, that, that, it was, that all of matter was evil, right? Now, I don't know about you, though. When I hear people talking about those things, abstaining from marriage and food, I'm thinking, how popular can that religion really be, right? I mean, you know, how exciting does that sound, right? I mean, you're telling me that I can't have my favorite food, you're telling me that I can't get married, you know, all the, you know, what, what, have you ever heard of the, uh, maybe some of you have heard of the, of the group, the Brethren, is that from, familiar to you at all? Um, this is a religious group that was an offshoot of the, of the 70s, of the Jesus movement of the 70s. I know some of you are familiar with the Jesus movement of the 70s, right? And the brethren, they avoid all worldly possessions, all pleasures, all that, none of those things. They, they avoid all that in order for them to purify themselves for the coming into the world. That's, this is their premise behind their doctrine. One article said that they essentially live as vagrants, doing odd jobs to survive, eating trash, Avoid bathing or medical treatment or give whatever money they make back to the group. If you're part of this group, there's no laughing or dancing or communicating with family, and they forbid contact with the opposite sex. Any, any takers this morning for that, right? Doesn't sound like something I really want to be a part of, but apparently this is a movement. This has been a movement. I think their founder died just a couple of years ago. I'm not sure exactly what their status is. But, but according to you know, their teaching... 
that you've got to be prepared or you've got to be pure as you prepare for the coming of Jesus. No possessions, no medicine, beat your body up, all of that. Does that surprise you? Well, it shouldn't. Because the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. See, the, the brethren, they're doing the exact same thing that was happening in the church at Ephesus. And the exact same thing that was going on in the church at Ephesus was going on in the church at Colossae. Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 2. He said, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do, uh, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. See, Paul says to the church that this type of practice looks really spiritual. Right? It has this appearance of wisdom. You know, you're really trying to deny yourself. You're really trying hard for Jesus. He says, but there's no value. There's no value. Strictly denying yourself food or marriage or whatever isn't the solution. He said, you're just beating yourself up for no reason. Jesus paid the price. Jesus took the, the, the harsh treatment so that you wouldn't have to. Right? This is, this is, do you understand what's happening here? This is what's going on in this church. Listen, if you're trying to earn God's favor by eating fish on Friday or avoiding pork or doing something to cause yourself pain because of your relationship with God, you're an heir. You aren't saved because you fast two days a week or because even you give all your money to the poor. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. That's how you're saved. That's, that, that's the gospel message. The people were deceived. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but deception, it always comes in the same way, right? Have you noticed this, that deception, I mean, we see this in the clearest form in the, in the very beginning, right? Remember in Genesis chapter, in the, in Genesis chapter 3, we see deception, the first deception occurs, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden, and Satan comes in, and he comes in a disguise, and that's always the way he always comes to us. He comes disguised, right? I mean, he doesn't come to you as, uh, again, as, you know, some scary, you know, if he comes to me today in the form of a snake, I'm out, right? There's, no, there's not going to be no discussion, especially if that thing starts talking. I mean, there's going to be no discussion, you know, none of that, right? But he's probably not going to approach you like that. Scripture reminds us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. He may come to you and, in a pleasing way, in a lie unknowingly, in a pleasant way. He comes in a, to, in a disguise, right? And we don't even recognize him. Like he, he's, all of a sudden, he's in our life. And not only that, but he, he comes and he wants to talk religion. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, he comes in a disguise, but he also wants to talk theology. And again, that may sound confusing, but one of his favorite subjects is religion. He comes to Adam and Eve, and he comes to Eve especially and says, did God really say that you can't eat fruit from any tree in the garden? Right? I mean, that sounds like an innocent question, right? He's like, hey, let's just be clear on God's word here. Right? We, I just want to make sure if I'm understanding what God's word says exactly. Is that what he said? He doesn't come to you and says, hey, oh, excuse me, I, I'm going to ruin your life. Right? He doesn't come and say, look, everything that God has in store for you, just eat this fruit and I'm, I'm going to ruin this for you. No. He just comes and he just distorts the word of God. Right? He just distorts God's word. He comes to Eve and says, did, did God really say that, you, 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 that you're going to die if you eat this fruit? No, 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 no. You misunderstood. You're not going to die. And then he keeps going and says, and, and not only that, Eve, but I've got to tell you, that tree, that's the one. Right? You're missing out. I mean, if you, you know, it, you know, God had given her everything she needed. But the devil wanted her to focus on the one thing that she didn't have. That one thing, she had access to every tree in the garden except for that one. But he deceived her. And he said, hey, that one tree, Eve, that one that you know it's off limits, that's the key to happiness. That's the key to life. I mean, that's the, key, that, that's the tree that you really want to eat from. 
In the same way that he deceived our first ancestors, he comes to you and he deceives you today. He wants you to believe that you're missing out on something. Right? I mean, Satan comes. Did God really say this? Right? I mean, he comes and he wants to talk religion, church. And he says, hey, did God really say cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you? I mean, really, did God say that? Because if that were really true, I mean, if that were true, you know, you wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't find yourself in the predicament that you're in today, right? I mean, all your needs would be met. Did God really say that to you? I mean, I'm just trying to make this clear. Satan comes to you today in the same way. Did God really say no sex before marriage? I mean, that's ridiculous. We live in the 21st century. You love each other. He is trying to steal your joy. What's going on? I mean, did God really say, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you? Because it seems like right now that God isn't anywhere to be around, right? He isn't, you know, I can't find him. Can you find him? What's, what's going on? I mean, did God really say not to get drunk on wine? I mean, that's just part of being an adult, right? I mean, you can handle this. What's the big deal? Did God say that marriage is to be permanent? Or the marriage is between a man and a woman. I mean, you deserve to be, to be happy. I mean, all, see, all, all these people that Paul is writing to Timothy about, they had been deceived to believe that they were missing out on some super spirituality. They're missing out on some strict self-discipline. But what they were really missing was Jesus. They were just missing Jesus. Paul says in verse 4 that everything God's created is good if it's received in the manner he intended, including food, including sex, right? But deception is a huge reason why people fall away from the faith. People are deceived. And don't believe that you can be above deception because you're not. But that's why you need to be in shape, right? That's why you need to be in shape. Look at verse 8. He says, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, some of you have been looking for a biblical reason not to exercise. This is about as close as you can get, right? You know, this is as close as you can get, right? You know, I wanted to go to the gym and work out, but, I, you know, I decided to stay home and read my Bible instead because that's what Scripture says, right? Godliness is more important than, you know, physical training, right? Well, that's not exactly Paul's point, but, you know, you know maybe you, whatever. But physical training has some value, right? But what he wants us to remember, that's what's most important, the training that we have is, is not so that we'll look like a bodybuilder or so that we can look like a runway model, but it's so that we'll look like Jesus. Right? That's the training that he's talking about here. Physical training, it's important. It's temporary. Godliness is eternal. You understand, church? I mean, godliness is eternal. For, for most of us, we get so consumed, right? I mean, we're, we're so consumed by the temporary things of the world. I think we miss out on the big picture. I mean, I, I've shared uh, this, this illustration with you before, at least in, in parts, and it's not original with me. But um, let, let's imagine, if you would, with this, this rope, that, that this represents, um, that it represents eternity. Um, and it's going to unwind on me. I, I, I really didn't want to unwind it because it looks so nice, you know, wrapped up. Like, I'll never be able to get it looking like that again. But, but let's say this rope represents eternity, right? And let's just say that it, that it just goes on and on and on forever, right? It never stops. That's what eternity and it's, 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 it is. It's non-ending. But this represents your life. The rest of this, this is eternity. This represents you, Right? And so what we do is that so many of us, we think that this is what really matters, right? We, we put all of our attention, all of our efforts in this, and we forget about all of this, right? We, we forget that we're, we're eternal beings. This, isn't, this is just temporary, what, we're, what, we're, what we consume with today. And we get so, again, so wrapped up in believing that this is what matters. And so we, we, we you know, we, you know, we, we do whatever it, we, you know, it takes to, to really live it up here. But the Bible teaches us that what we do with this determines this. That what we do here determines our eternity. 
And so the question is, I mean, for, for me at least, and again, I, I'm guilty of this as well, is that we make way too much of this. We make way too much of this little short amount of time that we spend in the world and not nearly enough time thinking about our eternity. And so the question becomes then, is how do we stay focused on this while living in this, right? And I think Paul's answer to Timothy here is that we train ourselves to be godly. We train ourselves to be godly. The only way that you can really focus on the eternal and really not just get consumed with what's going on day to day in this little short amount of time that we have, even if that's 100 years, listen, this is a bad illustration because in eternity, this, your life isn't going to even be that much, right? But how do we do it? I think we train ourselves to be godly. And you may say, well, I just thought you said that we didn't have to be ascetic. I just thought you said that we don't have to have strict self-discipline to deny ourselves in the name of religion. I mean, isn't that what Paul just said? We just stop beating yourself up? No, no. Training in godliness isn't about beating up your bodies or denying yourself pleasures that God has given you freely to enjoy. It's simply about taking your relationship with Him seriously. And that's what godliness is. Godliness in its simplest form is all about allowing God to become the center piece of your life. It's about focusing on the eternal while living in the temporary. Right? That's what godliness is. And, and I think one of the, the, the best examples of this comes from, uh, from the Old Testament. And if you remember the Old Testament, there's a guy named Enoch. And the, we, we meet him in Genesis chapter 5, and, and it's a brief encounter. We don't get anything. We're just reading about just the, the descendants uh, of Adam and Eve, right? And he shows up, and he's there in Genesis chapter 5. And do you remember him? He, he, he was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah is the oldest guy in, in, in all of Scripture. But Enoch is described like this in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch walked faithfully with God. That'd be pretty good to be on a headstone, right? I mean, that would, that would, that's, not a bad, that's not a bad five words there. Enoch walked faithfully with God. And then he shows back up in our New Testament. Thousands of years later, he shows up in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life. So he didn't experience death. Enoch was so faithful to God. God just said, you know, he lived a long time, but God took him up. He didn't experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. It's another pretty good description, isn't it? He was commended as one who pleased God. So we know that Enoch walked with God and Enoch pleased God. That's what it means to be godly. That the aim and the focus of your life is to walk with God and to please God. Right? And that's it, church. I mean, that, can, you, can you imagine if you, just, if you did that? So if you woke up every day and you said, Lord, my goal, Lord, Lord, this is your day. Right? I mean, where you lead me, I will follow. Lord, my goal is my desire is to walk with you and please you. What if you made that your prayer all the week? Lord, my, my desire, God, every day you wake up, Lord, my desire is to walk with you and please you. And so you know what happens? So every time you make a decision, you're filtering that decision through that. Is this pleasing to God? Am I walking with God? Every conversation that you have, you're filtering through that decision. Okay, God, is this something that pleases you? Are my words edifying here? Is this, am I walking with you? Every time we turn the TV on and we're channel, flipping through the channels, we're like, okay, God, is this, is this pleasing to you? This show that I'm watching, was this, is this bringing you honor? I'm worshiping you on Sunday and telling you your worth. Well, do I really believe that on Monday when I start flipping through the channels? When you post on Facebook or Twitter, social media, all those things, are you pleasing God? Are you walking with Him? In your dating 
life, your relationships. You see how this works? You're filtering all that godliness. Godliness is all about walking with God and pleasing Him. I don't know about you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that people can say about you. There's a lot of great compliments that someone could give you. But there isn't a better, in my opinion, there isn't a better thing someone can say. Is, he is a godly man. She is a godly woman. Right? Why wouldn't we want that to be part of our life? And it shows the example. We, we walk with God and we please Him. You make Him the focus of your life. And Paul says this is a priority. We train in godliness. We work for this to be part of our life. Not, we're not trying to beat ourselves. But we put ourselves in a position to be changed. We're, you know, through the Word of God, through worship, through a variety of different things. We put ourselves in those positions to be changed. Because physical training has some value, but it doesn't last. Godliness serves you for your eternity. It serves you for your eternity. Look, this morning, I, I, I just simply wanted to remind you that your relationship with God should be the most important relationship you have in your life. Your relationship with God should be the most important aspect of your life, period. It should be your focus. And you know a big reason why? Because the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith. And may that not be you. You've got to strive for godliness. You've got to work to be godly. You've got to, you've got to, every day with God, I'm just going, you are going to be the centerpiece of my life. Everything else, it's not going to last. It's just temporary. It's going to be gone here today, gone tomorrow. Verse 16, he says to Timothy, he's writing to him. This is a letter. He says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and and your hearers. You know, one of the great things about making God the priority and the centerpiece of your life is not only is not only you can be confident as you fight this good fight that you're going to persevere, but you're going to help somebody else go to heaven with you. And isn't that our goal? Isn't that what we want to do? We want to take as many people to heaven with us as we can. Listen, you're in a fight. You're in a fight, church. And the enemy wants to deceive you. I know that's, you know, I, I don't know. I, I try not to be the downer here, but I'm just, just laying it out there for you, right? You, you're, you're the, the, you have an enemy. You have an adversary who will do anything to keep you from God. You have an adversary who wants to do anything that he can to prevent you from finishing, to prevent you from persevering, to prevent you from, you know, to winning this fight. But God's given you everything that you need to overcome. You've got to stay in shape. Don't let your guard down. Watch your life and the things you believe closely. Where have you placed your faith today? If it's anywhere else other than Jesus, you're being deceived. You're being deceived. Paul writes this final verse. At least the final verse I'm going to read in verse 10. This is why we labor and strive. Because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Jesus came to save you. It is His will that no one perish, but ha all have eternal life. But you've got to place your belief, your trust, your hope in Him. We'd love to help you do that today. We can we're here for you. We're available to talk to you here in just a moment. We're going to have a, sing a, a song of worship and invitation. We invite you to come forward at that time. We'd be happy to talk to you or, or after the service. But remember that the Spirit clearly says in latter times, some will abandon the faith. May that not be you. May that not be me. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you just now, Lord. And Father, we especially want to lift up those who are here today, maybe, maybe on the fence. Lord, maybe there's some here today who kind of 
not really been walking with you, Lord. Maybe they would say that they're a Christian, but their their life doesn't really uh, doesn't really point it out, God. Maybe I pray that today that you will remind them that it's dangerous ground. Father, remind them that they have an enemy who wants to deceive them. Remind them that you've said that it's actually going to happen. And Father, may we firm up our faith today by exercising our way to godliness. Lord, maybe if there's here someone here today that's never placed his or her trust in you, our only source, our hope for salvation, pray that they would do that today. Lord, thank you for your love, for your mercy, most of all for Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. Let's be standing.